So today I'll be talking about the book Biology by Martin Lindstrom. Okay, so to introduce, what is biology? Biology is the subconscious thoughts, feelings and desires that drive our urge to purchase a product. <coughs> it's something we cannot really control, although we think we can. So it is the largest neuromarketing study uh, ever, ever conducted, uh, which is treated in this book by Martin. Uh, so you might ask yourself, what is neuromarketing? Neuromarketing is a combination of medical knowledge, so neuroscience, marketing and technology. So the use of uh, neuroscience, so knowledge of the brain, marketing which is uh, economics, and technology with the use of the SST scans and the fMRI scans that were used to conduct this huge study. It uncovers what our brain really wants for corporations and lets corporations give us what we really want, not what we think we want. Uh, and it was made so, as I said, with the use of SST brain scans. <coughs> the first thing I would like to talk about is that emotions win. Uh, we think that we uh, that we think rationally when we buy, but actually we don't. Emotions cloud our decisions, whether we like it or not. Uh, for example, a pretty new experiment uh, was made with students, and they were divided into two groups. One group was given a short-term reward, and the other one was given a delayed reward. So, uh, they were either given $15 in vouchers now or $20 in cash in two weeks' time. And 80% uh, of the students chose uh, that they wanted the $15 in vouchers right away. So, uh, this shows us that uh, we want to get instant gratification, which is the standard nowadays in the economy. So, uh, the efficacy of product placement. Uh, this is another thing that the author talks about in his book. And says the TV ads have become increasingly monotonous, unsurprising and boring. In 65, the average consumer remembered about uh, Thirty-four percent of TV ads and what they were advertising. When in two thousand seven the number fell to two point twenty-one ads, not percent, but ads, of remembered by someone ever. So the attention span has become extremely short. Our brains become oversaturated by ads, so we block them naturally with instinct. Uh, companies are turning to product integrations. For example, the author talks about the show American Idol, which was covered by three major companies, Coca-Cola, Singular, which is a, a telecommunication company, and Ford. Of course, we know what Ford is. Uh, so Coke, or Coca-Cola, had 60% of product placement in the show. And the couches were shaped like the bottle. Uh, this, were, this was the move, uh, less noticeable stuff. It was more subconscious. But it, there, were, there was also some blatant advertising like the, the choice of drink that the judges uh, drank. So it was obvious, it was everywhere. Everything was red, and of course this is the color of Coca-Cola. Singular uh, sponsored the, the voting system and was advertised every time uh, the voting system was open to vote for the contestants. And Ford fell in last place, it made a huge mistake, and uh, they only advertised during the ad, uh, ad breaks. Uh, and this was a bad decision, because during the ad breaks, people have learned to just ignore what is in the ads, and just to switch to another channel or to mute it, so the ads were not perceived. Subliminal messaging works, another topic he treated. Uh, subliminal messaging is something that is kind of a taboo nowadays and has been for the last 20 some years. It is considered brainwashing and uh, contrary to the public interest. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, squabble around subliminal messaging, but this present nowadays. 
the experiment was that Martin talks about. Uh, they took, they divided some elderly people uh, from uh, 70 to 90 years into two groups. Uh, the two groups were given a video game to play. Uh, the first group uh, so it had a series of positive words flash up onto the screen, <laughs> like wise, accomplished, and successful, and etc. And the B group had negative words, so senile, deceased, boring, stupid, etc. Uh, then they were made to get up and to walk around. They were released, so to say. And uh, the hang time, the swing time, was measured in their gates. So the gait is a sequence of movements that, uh, com that compose a step. And the swing time is the time where uh, the leg, the foot, is off the ground and makes a new step. And the A group's uh, air time was longer, so uh, this indicated a positive uh, mental uh, stimuli can, be, can affect the physical. Another thing he treats is, do logos still work? So there, have been, there has been a lot of discussion lately uh, where people uh, say that logos are dead and can even reduce sales because some are too garish. They advertise uh, their purpose too much and become boring for the, for the consumer. So they mainly shut it out because as we know its purpose, it's not longer used. And minimalistic logos might work better. Uh, in the next slide, I will show you some examples. One example uh, that we can find in the book is that Marlboro, the famous cigarette company, tobacco company, uh, uses everyday objects and styles such as color schemes to simulate uh, an, uh, an advertising environment. For example, they use uh, similar symbols to the Marlboro logo, uh, ashtray designs and sofas in order to uh, give the consumer uh, uh, an environment which is uh, infused with the Marlboro uh, brand without directly using the logo anywhere. So it's also in some way subliminal, subliminal and subconscious. We only need a visual image that reminds us of a product or brand. So a reminder, a connotation. Um, we associate uh, something to a brand for it to seemingly imperceptibly register, uh, register in our brains and cause an appropriate reaction. So these are some examples. Uh, this, this was made by, by uh, I think, Polish designer. So this wasn't commissioned by any of the huge brands. For example, we have uh, cornflakes. Uh, we can see the, the bowl of cornflakes and this is, super, this is um, too much. And with the uh, stable progression, we see the design is all the more simpler and minimalistic. Or, for example, vanish. Uh, there is a lot of colors and uh, uh, flourish of designs, and then at the end, we just see a, a, a pink container with just the words vanish on. Or Nutella, even better. There is a piece of bread with the Nutella spread on. We know that we have to spread it, you don't have to show it to us. <laughs> so the logo is the only thing that's necessary. Then he talks about superstition and rituals that give us certainty. So we know in history that religious rituals have been something that have connected us uh, as the human species, the, the human race. So rituals within products give, an, give us an illusion of comfort and belonging. We have an example with Oreos, a famous cookie in, uh, in America. Uh, and Nabisco, the manufacturer of Oreos, which has been around for ages, has partnered with the Got Milk campaign, which sponsored the uh, healthy milk for all schools, and they even uh, handed out free milk cartons. And this, uh, so there is a picture of the carton, Got Milk, Get Oreos, so keep your milk from getting lonely. So this promotes uh, the synergy between the two brands. And this resulted in an expectable boost in sales as it created a national wide ritual. Everybody uh, drank milk with Oreos inside. And there are two ways of being eaten so dry or with milk. Uh, brands are equal to religions. 
Uh, this is also another topic that Martin treated in the book. So, uh, similar to rituals, a unity exists between consumers of the same brand. Uh, they uh, want to be on the, on, on the side, they feel safer and stronger if uh, they can find someone else that shares the same view, the same uh, brand preference. An experiment that was done, that is quite amazing, is the mysterious X9 factor, which is in fact a work of fiction. Millions of shampoo bottles were falsely advertised to uh, the presence of the X9 factor. In fact, um, Procter & Gamble, a huge uh, cosmetic company owned by Unilever, which is even bigger, um, uh, their worker in Malaysia, where, they're, where, where they um, manufacture this particular shampoo, uh, he was bored one day and he decided to uh, add four words, so contains the X9 factor onto the label. This wasn't seen, this wasn't noticed by the, uh, by the P&G, so Procter & Gamble uh, big heads, and it went into production. And the first couple of million uh, bottles of shampoo contained these four words. And the people didn't know that this was actually anything uh, effective this X9 factor even existed, in fact it didn't, it was made up. And what was interesting that when a new run of shampoos were being manufactured without, so the, the Procter & Gamble uh, bosses realized that this was written on, but they didn't, they didn't want to pull back all the products that already had it, uh, they, uh, they printed a normal version without the four words added and they noticed a significant drop in sales, even though the people didn't even know what they were, didn't, didn't even knew what they were buying. And the product, some people even complained that it didn't work, and there was no change in product. So this just shows us how gullible we are. <coughs> Martin uh, talks about the multiple senses to lock in a brand, so to speak. He says that sight, smell and visual stimuli, and even tactile nowadays, are very similar So, in their intensity, in their strength. Uh, for example, today we have packaging which, which is not only, for example, uh, packed bread was once just given either in a paper bag or in a normal plastic bag. Nowadays, higher brands uh, use a matte finish on the, on the plastic. So it uh, reminds us more on, uh, about bread. Um, reminds us more of bread. So it's it's uh, smooth to touch. Uh, visual images are more effective when linked to other senses. So this synergy between senses um, is more effective than just uh, visual or uh, an auditory. For example, in supermarkets, there is the use of music. Uh, for example, the types of music played in supermarkets. Uh, they made an experiment where they played French music in the wine section and actually it boosted the sales of French wines. Uh, for example, also smell can change, the peop uh, can change people's attitudes uh, in front of some products. For example, Samsung uses the fragrance of honeydew melon to boost electronic sales in their stores. But this is all uh, imperceptible or at least in a very uh, low amount, so it's all subconscious, but we, we, uh, we perceive this. For example, meadowgrass fragrance is used in British Airways business lounges to simulate a pleasant environment, so to make the people feel safer and uh, nicer and more comfortable. Uh, colors increase their recognition up to 80%. This is a huge cipher and it's something amazing that uh, it kind of contradicts the previous statement about the minimalistic logos because they use uh, the, the traditional logos use more colors. However, they are a bit kitsch, so it deters the buyer. If, uh, for example, complementary colors were to be used, it would, of course, boost recognition. Uh, yes, and the logo and the theme tune are more memorable. So if, you, if a logo, a good logo, is 
combined with a memorable theme tune, uh, something that is quite simple, uh, some sort of jingle, it becomes much more memorable. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we have new product development, which is another field where neuromarketing is used. Uh, Martin says that neuromarketing has helped predict the success of a new product. So, uh, studies are made at each uh, at the development stage of a product uh, where companies try to predict the, the possible success of a product, whether it will be successful or not. And sadly, 8 out of 10 of new product launches fail because the companies don't really know what people want. However, this could all change with Neurobook. For example, he uh, talks about an experiment where four groups of 50 men and women <coughs> were given a show to watch alongside with another show. Uh, two groups were shown, uh, so there were three shows. Uh, Quizmania, which was the new show, which wasn't uh, yet public. Uh, the Swan, which is a beauty pageant, which was very, uh, which, which was uh, a fiasco, a failure, and uh, How Clean Is Your House, which is even shown on on a local TV, or at least it was, which was extremely successful. And then, uh, so the two groups were shown uh, the failure, so the failure with the new show. And the other two groups were shown the, the successful one with the new show. And what, uh, what uh, the scientists uh, realized is that the results mirror the relative, the, the relative success of each show. So the successful show influenced the new show and uh, made the watchers think that it was not so bad. Uh, when, uh, when on the other hand, the bad show influenced badly on the new show, obviously. These are all true shows, it all happened. Uh, so, another famous topic which is talked about, which has been uh, commonplace even nowadays, and 50 years, 40 years back, is that sex sells. It is just a pure fact. However, uh, it has been losing power. The, the, the shock value of sex in advertisements has been, has been losing value. Uh, one fifth of ads use sexual innuendos uh, to sell the product. For example, if you, if you have seen uh, the uh, Obot, uh, what's the name? Ivo TV, the ad of Ivo TV by Krotzke Post, it also uses a sexual innuendo. Uh, so the experiment was made where 400 subjects were shown ads with varying levels of sexual content and were asked to click the part, the part of the image that first caught their attention. Uh, obviously, uh, the result that only 9.8% uh, remembered what the ad was selling if it contained uh, sexual innuendo. 20% of non-sexual ads were remembered for their purpose, so obviously, uh, the, and this is called the vampire effect. So, the sex symbol in the ad uh, pulls away from the real meaning and the real purpose of the ad. Uh, and the results in women were quite similar. In women it was I think 10.40% uh, and uh, by uh, I think 23% uh, of the second figure. And uh, he says that in this era sex is so accessible and over commercialized that he has lost its shock value. So it doesn't work so good anymore. They, uh, people will need to think about something that is a bit more effective. And for example, there's um, uh, an ad for the Pontiac Star Chief, which is a limousine, which says spread your legs. Obviously, this is very direct, but they want to indicate that it has a lot of room. Then he talks about mirror neurons, which are he thinks the future of advertising. So uh, there's a, there's a technique in neurolinguistic programming which is called mirroring. So you mirror the actions of uh, your speaking partner of your target, 
and they automatically feel more comfortable to talk about something. Uh, they, they feel safer because you're more similar to them. So he, he says that nerves in our brains are responsible for the feeling we get when we relate to something we are seeing or thinking about. These are the mirror neurons. Uh, purchases are also linked to reproductive success. Uh, the success in, in, the, uh, in, our, in, in, in the society. And our status, we buy things which make us look good and elevate, elevate us in, up in the social hierarchy. So it makes us, uh, we buy a gold watch, it makes us look more successful and more important. Uh, an expensive suit or some expensive shoes. It all indicates, whether we like it or not, uh, our social status. For example, if we see someone in a uh, scruffy, scruffy old white t-shirt and some jeans, we suppose that he doesn't have a lot of money. And also this works vice versa. If we, someone, if we see someone with, a, with an expensive car and an expensive watch, we automatically assume that he's rich and wealthy. Uh, dopamine, uh, which is a chemical compound found in our brain, which is uh, linked to happiness, is released while shopping and purchasing something we fancy. Uh, some stores in the States have been uh, testing a new method uh, by releasing hormones in the air to stimulate uh, dopamine and to uh, cause, well, not to cause, to promote uh, buying of products. However, hormones are very expensive and they're not used so much as uh, marketers would like to. And to conclude, in the end, uh, so neuromarketing is definitely the future. It is something that is inevitable in the future of marketing and commerce. And a uh, thing that I forgot to add at the beginning, that only 10% of the brain controls decisions consciously. So we only know about, uh, so 10% of the decisions we make is in our direct all else, all else is controlled by our instincts, by our internal wishes, and by, by our emotions. And he thinks that all future products will be branded using information gathered from brain scans, so from neuromarketing. This is uh, quite uh, a risky uh, conclusion made by him, because well, it's not so risky, but uh, it's definitely founded because we have seen the proof. But maybe not all companies will want to adhere to this. Despite the cost, so neuromarketing is extremely expensive because of the expensive equipment and the time and the volunteers uh, and the, all the logistics that are involved in this, uh, raise quite a high cost and may raise also the budget of a certain product, a certain company. Uh, but many companies, many huge companies like uh, Unilever, uh, Microsoft and Dior uh, are already using this technology to develop new products and to uh, be more successful. So it is an investment but it is a long-term investment. Thank you for your attention.